Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, Justin Trudeau's disrespect of freedom of speech and why conservatives shouldn't fall into the liberals' environmental trap. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Well, 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 what do you know? Justin Trudeau's liberals still aren't all that fond of free speech. I did a little video the other day in which I talked about a tweet from Francois-Philippe Champagne, Canada's foreign minister, making what I thought to be a very equivocal stand for free speech rather than the unequivocal stand for free speech that is warranted with what's happening in France. And just to give you a little bit of backstory here, France has had a a spate of Islamist terror attacks over the last couple of weeks, starting with the uh, killing of a teacher who dared to show the Charlie Hebdo cartoons of Muhammad in a classroom discussion on free speech. His punishment was being killed by an Islamist terrorist who doesn't believe in free speech. You fast forward, the French government refuses to bend the knee, says we will always stand up for freedom of expression, even with people trying to slaughter and succeeding in some cases in slaughtering French citizens in the streets. Because you do not capitulate on core fundamental values like that of freedom. So when I saw that Canada's foreign minister said he was supporting freedom of speech with respect or freedom of expression with respect, I knew what was happening because I've seen this rhetoric time and time again. And I actually had an email from someone yesterday identifying themselves as the grammar police saying that I'm illiterate or something like that because I was misreading it and he actually meant that he's being respectful in his... No, no, no. I said the reason I knew that is because I've seen the government go down this road before and I'm very aware of this government's position on free speech. And the broader point that I made was that the liberals are only interested, and not just the Liberal Party, I'm talking about progressives in general, are only interested in discussing the limits of speech because they don't actually have that ideological or philosophical commitment to freedom of speech. And what do you know, Justin Trudeau proved me right. Trudeau was speaking about what France has been experiencing and said that free speech has limits. Oh yes, he said we will always defend freedom of expression, except always has a a bit of an invisible asterisk there. He said freedom of expression is not without limits. We owe it to ourselves to act with respect for others and to seek not to arbitrarily or unnecessarily injure those with whom we are sharing a society and a planet. We do not have a right, for example, to shout fire in a movie theater crowded with people. There are always limits. This is a very disingenuous argument that we hear from people, and in fact, one of the best rebukes of it I've ever heard, and I can't remember who I heard it from, so I apologize for not citing them, was that you're allowed to shout fire in a crowded theater when the theater is in fact on fire. And that's the whole point of this right now. If you're speaking out against Islamist terror and you're speaking out against people that are going to kill you for uh, having an opinion, for saying something that might be offensive or unwise, well, that is exactly why that sort of speech is necessary. You shouldn't be censoring it because other people decide that you deserve to be killed for saying it, for doing it. And again, the point I made, because I've had people, uh, including a very kind email from a a Muslim person who said, well, how would you like it if someone was depicting your God in such a a terrible way? And I said, I would hate it. And I do deal with that. There was that famous uh, artwork of sorts, I don't even know if you can call it art, some time back called Piss Christ, which I don't even like saying it because I feel like it's using the name of Christ in vain. But that was what it was. And it was, as is imagined, a depiction of Jesus suspended in urine. I saw that. I've seen many other things. I've seen in Charlie Hebdo, for example, depictions of Christians and especially depictions of of Jews. I'm not Jewish, but I I have a a great many friends who are that are not exactly pleased with being depicted the way they are in Charlie Hebdo. But they are not killing people for sharing them. They are not killing people for doing that. 
Christians are not killing people for doing that. A vast majority of Muslims are not. But you've got a, enough of a subset that is, and then you've got people like Erdogan in Turkey that are standing up and saying that they're basically going to war with France over this, that they want to boycott French products. And then you've got the former prime minister of Malaysia saying that Muslims are right to stand up and kill. So you've got people that are coming from a, a place of having some cachet on this that are standing up and saying that, oh, no, no, these are not outliers. We need to fight against France's commitment to free speech. And that's why the battle lines have been drawn here in a way that you can't just say, oh, well, these are just individual terrorists. They don't speak for any broader movement because there are people that do have some leadership that are getting up and saying, no, countries should not allow free speech if that free speech is used to mock one particular religion. To which I would reiterate what I said in my video the other day, you don't need to protect free speech that is inoffensive. If I, am going, if I am to go out and say the sky is blue, that requires no legal protection because everyone finds it to be a completely banal statement, I hope. I mean, it's 2020, so who knows? If I go out and say, I'm not even going to say anything. I don't want to give someone something that's, <laughs> that could be clipped against me. But if I say something that is offensive, well, that needs legal protection because that's exactly the kind of speech that someone would try to have censored. So this idea that we should draw the limit at what is no longer free speech, at as Trudeau said, and as Monsieur Champagne said, speech that does not respect, that is bollocks, frankly, and does not actually align with what freedom of speech is. And I get very passionate about this issue, if you haven't understood it, for two reasons. Number one, I was actually in line with a lot of my friends and colleagues that were at the really hotbed battles of free speech before the Canadian Human Rights Commissions. If you go back, uh, you know, what, 14, 13, 12 years now. I had friends that were facing human rights complaints because of things they wrote. Blogger Kathy Shadle, a good friend of mine, has had to go through this rigmarole. My friend and colleague Mark Stein, who battled the human rights tribunals alongside Ezra Levant and won. But this was a long slog, and if you were in blogging when I was, if you were blogging when the government actually had a mechanism to go after so-called internet hate speech, you'd understand why it's important that governments have to commit to free speech and not start saying, oh, but, but you know, only if it's respectful. That was his line. We owe it to ourselves to act with respect for others and to seek not to arbitrarily or unnecessarily injure those with whom we are sharing the planet. He's not saying that in the guidance of some sort of moral lesson of, wow, we should all respect one another, like it's some, you know, nonsensical Trudeau after school special. He's saying that in the context of talking about the limits of freedom of expression. He's associating free speech with limits and limits with you have to have respect for others. And that in and of itself is quite a, a disrespectful position to people living in what they thought was going to be a free country. And whether the liberals are going to act on this or not is not really a question. Remember, I've talked about this in the past. It would have been a year and a half ago. I was in Ottawa when they were having hearings on online hate. And the day that I was there was the day that my colleague Lindsay Shepard, Mark Stein, and Professor John Robson were testifying before the committee, which was the same day, incidentally, that the committee voted to purge MP Michael Cooper's comments from the record. He had made a comment uh, in response to uh, something a, a witness had said about the New Zealand killer, and the committee voted to just evaporate uh, Michael Cooper's words because they thought they were offensive. So how ironic that on a discussion about censorship, the committee committee itself undertook an act of censorship. And the very nature of these committee meetings was because the Liberals were exploring whether to bring back a form of that Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act that I mentioned earlier that was used to go after so-called online hate speech. And with the pandemic, the Liberals haven't gotten around to it yet, but they have committed to exploring something like this, which means there could be an online hate ban coming. Which, if you're a, a normal person that doesn't pay attention to these issues, you'd think, well, eh, that sounds pretty reasonable. You know, I don't like hate. I don't like people being mean. Well, they haven't yet defined hate. And I assure you, the definition will not be one that does not cut a huge swath around forms of protected discourse that, while you may not like them, are, in fact, a part of free speech and a part of free and open debate. 
And the other aspect of this is just this malignant relationship between government and big tech. And I'm firmly opposed, and I have remained firmly opposed to regulating Twitter and Facebook, even when I see examples of, of just rampant censorship from big tech. In fact, uh, just I think it was yesterday or two days ago, Twitter finally finally unlocked the New York Post Twitter account. So since October 14th, the New York Post has been banned from tweeting because they tweeted a link to their story about Hunter Biden, a story that has actually been verified. The emails have since been verified. And there was no question about their authenticity. Twitter just said, ah, it violates our policy. Now, as it so happens, Twitter has changed that policy and still didn't until yesterday, I think it was, a takedown or allow New York Post to start tweeting again. And then they did this big tweet about, oh, you know, we've decided that, uh, you know, even though we normally don't retroactively uh, reverse decisions because this was the one that made us change the policy, we've decided that we're going to like, they, they were just trying to twist themselves in knots because they realized they lost. They aimed, they fired, and they missed. And Twitter lost because the backlash has been so significant. But what's happening now is that I do not believe government regulation will help any of these things. They will only hurt them. So when I hear talk about uh, governments regulating social media companies into complying, I'm saying hell no. And in Canada, a lot of that is going to be whether governments look to Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc., when it comes to regulating online hate speech. Instead of using the human rights commissions, just using these corporate censors. And there was a, an article in the National Post I, I wanted to share about where the group is calling for an end to the cozy and unacceptable relationship between senior government officials and Facebook. Now, this is a story, oddly enough, about Friends of Canadian Broadcasting, which is this like CBC shill group that I normally don't <laughs> quite like. But they are calling uh, this out based on documents that were released by the Toronto Star showing a very, again, cozy relationship between Facebook and Canadian Heritage. In one particular case in February, Facebook's head of public policy, uh, Kevin Chan, emailed an official at Canadian Heritage basically trying to recruit talent, saying, hey, do you know of anyone in the public service that we can get to, to come and work for Facebook? And, and just this idea of just, you need someone and you just want to go to the government and say, hey, you know, anyone we can offer a job to? Uh, and the idea that Facebook is, is ramping up its operations in Canada, not in tech, not in development, but in governance is something to watch. I know of a number of former political staffers that have gone over to Facebook and, you know, some are liberal, some are conservative, but still Facebook is making its lobbying presence larger and larger, which means that Facebook wants something out of this. Now, my hope is that they're going to lobby against having themselves regulated, but what's happening is you end up just having these connections and these ties and these relationships that exist between government and Facebook that will span whichever government is there. And while in some ways that's just a part of how business operates in Canada, it also leads to a great many questions. Do we want these getting in bed together? Do we want all of a sudden Facebook being awarded a government contract for fact-checking? Do we want Canadian elections to come with a, a priority that Facebook and Twitter have to act in a certain way? And all of a sudden the government's hands are clean. They don't need to get dirty by saying, you know, we're ordering something down. The social media companies have these policies that they're putting in place to avoid regulation, which to the end user are regulation, to the end user still manifest as censorship. So we have all of these different areas where the government is going after free speech and may go after free speech and is poised to go after free speech. And people wonder why I take issue with the word respect in a tweet by Minister Champagne or in a, in a comment by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau because they are so concerned about the limits of free speech that it means they don't actually have an underlying commitment to free speech itself. And once that commitment is gone... All of these other things are fair game. All of these other areas are up for grabs. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. 
Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Let's talk about the Paris Accord. I know it's a topic we haven't heard much of, and that's because the Liberal government and also the mainstream media tend to accept at face value and take for granted that the Paris Accord is a good thing. I'm not so convinced, but I also want to talk about how conservatives tend to fall into a trap on Paris and also on other environmental policies. And I'm going to be perfectly frank, what triggered this discussion, what what, what it was that motivated me to talk about this, was a speech that Leslin Lewis, the conservative candidate for Haldeman Norfolk and a former leadership candidate for the party, said in an address at the United Conservative Party annual general meeting about a week ago. She was one of the keynote speakers at the virtual AGM. She was speaking at the conference to Alberta Conservatives from Toronto, and a lot of what she said was entirely on point. She talked about being more of an Albertan at heart and her strong showing in the leadership race in Alberta and the values of Albertans and all of that. But she also devoted a considerable amount of her speech. And when I say considerable, I mean she kept coming back to it, talking about the Paris Accord. Now, when you're speaking to Alberta conservatives, you're going to think that the person is going to be talking about how terrible Paris is, right? And how Canada should have its own made in Canada approach to the environment. And well, that wasn't what happened. Just take a watch. The fight is right here in this country and not in an international realm. And the best example of this is when we look at the Paris Accord. Our our energy industry has been under attack for years even before Justin Trudeau's anti-energy legislation began to cripple the oil sector and the gas sector, activists were hard at work to kneecap this industry. But I believe that the Paris Accord is really just a distraction. Canada is the only G7 nation in the world that has implemented the job-killing national carbon tax. It was not the Paris Accord that drove $100 billion worth of investments out of this country. Neither was it the Paris Accord that caused over 100,000 oil and gas workers to lose their jobs. The Liberals want to divide the Conservatives by having us focus on the Paris Accord and not focus on their bad laws. If we continue to focus on the Paris Accord, we lose sight of the domestic policies that are crippling, like the carbon tax, Bill C-48, like Bill C-69. We must hold the Liberals to account for these bad environmental policies. Within the last five years, there's been three pipelines that were canceled. One was purchased by the government, likely never to be completed. Albertans are victims of laws that are passed right here in this country. But it is so easy for us to point the finger outside of this country. And I know that as Canadians, it's emotionally easier if we could look to the United Nations and blame them for all our problems. But as while I have many problems with the United Nations, I have to say this, our wounds and Alberta's wounds have been self-inflicted by the policies of this nation. If the United Nations has any influence over us, it's because our government gave them that authority. We relinquished our sovereign rights over the environment, not through the Paris Accord, but because of national legislations like Bill C-48 and Bill C-69. These laws must be repealed. International agreements are largely voluntarily, voluntary. And with respect to the Paris Climate Agreement, it is at best an aspirational agreement. It is a non-binding international agreement that we could easily meet with our eyes closed. And it, 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 all we need to do, essentially, is do what we have been doing and what we do best. And that is being the world leader in the clean energy creation 
and innovation sector. Now, that is by no means the entirety of it. As I said, she kept going back to it, making these defenses of Paris. And at some times, they seem to be a bit more tacit. But generally speaking, what she was saying is that conservatives should shut up about the Paris Climate Accord. And you know what? I could not disagree more. Now, just to take this out of abstract terms, the Paris Agreement is a United Nations framework signed by a great many countries, 196 of them, including Canada, talking about very specific targets for climate change. The goal is to keep the increase in global average temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5%, and to set very specific greenhouse gas emissions targets. Now, the whole point of this is that that it is a bit of a farce in some ways. The fact that Canada should shoulder the burden of what is pollution caused by China and India and other large emitters, if in fact we can blame climate change on this sort of pollution as directly. And I know I've talked about this on the show in the past. There are a great many questions about just how anthropogenic global warming is versus natural variability and all of that stuff. I don't want to get into that right now because I do want to talk about the politics of it. But the Paris Accord is an agreement that Canada has used as justification to pursue very aggressive anti-jobs, anti-economic, pro-environment policies or supposedly pro-environment policies. So when anyone says that Paris is quote-unquote non-binding, it doesn't really matter because Canada has chosen to use Paris as a guiding principle and as a legal justification and a moral justification to do what the Justin Trudeau government wants to do on the environment, the national carbon tax being one of the most notable examples. So for Leslin Lewis, who went through the leadership race without actually saying what she thought about Paris, to come out now and say, oh, Paris is great, conservatives shouldn't talk about it, we're already going to do it, we're doing it with our eyes closed, I'm like, well, hang on here. Why were you not talking about this during the leadership race? Why, when you were courting votes from conservative Canadians, did you not own up to it? And I want to actually go very specifically to what Leslin Lewis said in her leadership platform, and this is still on her website. She pledges to put other international agreements under a microscope to ensure that Canada is not relinquishing sovereignty to any foreign entity on any matter. Quote, that includes a thorough review of the Paris Accord, and if it is found that it is encroaching on our sovereignty or not in our best interest, we will withdraw from it as well. Unquote. So here's what she's saying. We'll have a review of it, and if it's not in our best interest, if it encroaches in our sovereignty, then we'll withdraw from it. Well, hang on there. I do believe she's insulting people's intelligence just a little bit, because on the very same page, she talks about her bona fides in this area. She says, as prime minister, I vow to use my experience in negotiating international agreements and my PhD in international law to make sure that Canada is no longer seen as the pushover it has been for the last five years. She's got a PhD in international law. I believe that at the time she said that, she fully knew what there was to know about Paris. And if not, why has the position changed so much in the last couple of months to, well, we'll see, to, oh, no, 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 it's good. We all have to shut up about it. It's just a wedge that conservatives are using. And incidentally, in uh, November, sorry, in February of 2019, she had actually tweeted to Peter McKay about how great the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris were to international law. This was in response to a tweet that Peter McKay did talking about how great the UN was, and that was in February of 2019. And I saw this on Dan McTagg's Affordable Energy website, a, a former Liberal MP, but one who's actually very solid on green energy scams. And uh, McTagg had actually called Leslie Lewis, the green energy candidate, because he pointed out that even though she checks the boxes on wanting to repeal the carbon tax and bills C-48 and C-69, she also had these very sort of murky and questionable relationships with a lot of green energy schemes that we know are very costly, including going right back to a dissertation she wrote, where she actually talked about trying to attract foreign investment for green energy projects. And as McTagg says, she focused on third world countries that are at a disadvantage when it comes to green energy, as they often cannot afford the patents to build the green infrastructure. So he's pointing out here that she knows her stuff. She knows about these issues, which is why I don't think she was not fully aware of the implications of the Paris Climate Accord. 
Now, her argument, okay, if we are already on track to do these things, then why worry about Paris? Well, there's a symbolic aspect to it, but also a very tactical one, because even if we are already doing, generally speaking, quite well on environmental issues compared to other parts of the world and the global south and the developing world, then Paris is in a lot of ways very theatrical. But Justin Trudeau is still using Paris as justification to do all sorts of things. They've made it this linchpin of Canadian environmental policy. And for any conservative to start accepting liberal premises on these things is very dangerous. But more importantly, why not own up to it? If that was your view that this is great and conservatives should stop complaining about it, why not own up to that in the leadership race? And some people may think I'm picking on Leslin Lewis. I'm not. That's not the intent. The fact is she's a very high profile member of the Canadian conservative movement. And if elected in her riding, which she probably will be, it's very likely she's going to be a very significant player in conservative politics moving forward. And I would say that this is a reason that we need to be listening very carefully. So when she's going to go before Alberta conservatives... Alberta conservatives and say, well, you know, you guys shouldn't complain about Paris all that much. There are a lot of people in the grassroots there and across the country that I think are, are not going to be too pleased with that. Which brings me to my broader point about how conservatives engage on environmental issues. If you believe that global warming is this big giant threat and you believe that we need to find ways to tackle it, to reduce emissions, to do all of this, okay, that is completely fine. If you don't, and I think most conservatives are people that would be lumped into the denier or skeptic category by the alarmists. Most conservatives, I think, are people that say, yes, the climate is changing. Yes, we need to be conservationists and good stewards of the environment. But do we need to tax our way into saving the environment? No. Can we compete with the Chinas and the Indias and the South Koreas of the world? No. On in terms of our, our emissions, or should we even have to? Are we even in the same realm? Even the United States, for example. And can we allow the market to work in this area? I would say yes. So most conservative Canadians who are conscious of these issues are not alarmists. We take a very measured and, dare I say, conservative approach to these things. However, and this is the big question, are we going to win any votes as small-c conservatives on these issues? I'm going to say no. And I'm going to tell you a story about the time that I ran as a candidate. I've talked about this period of my life before. I, I ran for the Progressive Conservatives in Ontario in 2018. And when I went knocking on doors, we knocked on over 20,000 of them, I asked the same question to pretty much everyone I met. What are the issues you care about? And in the 21,000 doors that I knocked on, and the thousands of people to whom I asked that question, one person, one person said the environment is their top concern. And you better believe they weren't going to be a conservative voter. That was it. One person. And I'm not saying that my riding in London West was representative of the entire population. I'm also not saying that the environmental issues were not a close second behind the issues that people told me were their number ones. But I am saying that this is not the top of mind issue for most real voters. We're told it should be. We're told it has to be. In some cases, we're told by the media it is. But for the most part, it is not. And in a lot of cases, I think it's like why PBS used to always have such high representation in surveys in the U.S., but not in actual uh, metrics for viewership, because people want to say that they're watching it. They want to sound smart. They want to sound virtuous when they tell a pollster, ah, oh, yes, I care about climate change. But when the chips are on the table, this is not moving votes as much. And certainly not conservatives. Conservatives are not going to outflank the liberals, the NDP, the Green Party on environmental issues. Conservatives are not going to win votes from those sorts of people. So if the equivocation that conservatives tend to do on environmental issues is for votes, it's not going to work. And that's where I go back to what I said before. If you believe it, great. But if you're doing it just because you think you're going to get votes from it, you're not. You're not going to win on the liberals' turf, which is why you have to stop accepting their premises. And this is so key because the second you accept your opponent's premises, you have lost. You have absolutely lost because what you're doing is you're actually deciding you're going to play their game on their field by their rules and you're never going to play it as well as them. We need to start replacing those premises with our own premises 
and pointing out, well, hang on, let's let's take a step back here. And this is why uh, I had a, a bit of mixed feedback last week to the interview I did with Dr. Uh, Elmira Ali Akbari from the Fraser Institute, because she's a, an economist who's determined that carbon taxes can be good, but most of the political manifestations of them we see are not. And I mentioned in the interview that, listen, I'm not a, a carbon tax fan. However, I did think there was merit in having the discussion with her about what it would look like if there was going to be such a thing as a good one. Could that even happen? And I got a lot of people that were saying, oh, well, you know, how are you talking to someone who supports a carbon tax? And I had other people that uh, came at me like uh, this person did uh, an email I got from uh, a gentleman named Andrew who writes, I was mystified by your conclusion. Why is it an entirely defensible position to be against any kind of carbon tax? What was it in uh, Dr. Ali Akbari's logical train that you disagreed with? Please explain. Her paper really adopts the same basic framework as one finds in a 2008 paper by Jack Mintz and Nancy Olaweiler. I might have that name wrong. I apologize. Jack Mintz certainly detests the Trudeau carbon tax, but he hasn't changed his views about carbon taxes in general. The Conservative Party and the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party would seem to have taken exactly the wrong position on GHG emissions, favoring the Paris target while rejecting any kind of carbon tax. They should take the opposite position, favoring some kind of carbon tax while rejecting the Paris target. And he goes on in, in the uh, email to uh, point to a paper by Ross McKittrick at the University of Guelph, which I've read, and I've actually interviewed uh, Dr. McKittrick about this very topic. And we actually were on the same cruise in Alaska a little while ago. So we got to see the uh, glaciers, which uh, supposedly were, uh, I guess, supposed to have been melting by the minute. In fact, maybe the uh, glaciers are all gone right now if you <laughs> if you listen to the alarmist but I'm very aware of this issue and he says why are you opposed to a carbon tax and I here's here's why number one yes there are all of these circumstances that have said a carbon tax can work if 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 and this was the uh, basis of the interview last week with Dr. Ali Akbari. Uh, revenue neutrality is one of them. If the money raised is actually uh, taking away from other taxes, there are a number of metrics there. But I do not trust that that is possible. So I have a pragmatic opposition, which is that the theoretical carbon tax that could have an effect is not going to exist because governments are not interested in going down those roads. So I'm not going to get into this game of, well, I support this carbon tax, but not that carbon tax, because I know that once you move into a political discourse, that distinction's gone. That nuance is absolutely gone. And number two, I refuse to accept a policy that is based on the idea of penalizing industry when Canada is not the problem. And I know the logical response to that is, oh, well, if, uh, you know, every country were to say that, but we're not talking about that. When we in Canada and the United States and Britain and France and Germany talk about, oh, we've got to lower this percentage, that percentage, we've got to reduce nitrous oxide and CO2 and all of that, what they are completely missing is that all it does is grow and grow and grow the availability in the market for giant manufacturers in other parts of the world to swoop in. And one of the hallmarks of globalization is that you have to accept that your country does not exist in a silo. You are competing as an Ontarian with people in Michigan. You're competing, uh, competing as a Michigan with people in Mexico, with people in Germany. You're competing with people all around the world. So we cannot expect that we can make ourselves uncompetitive through a form of taxation that only has a murky at best relationship with actually reducing emissions. So I refuse to go down that road. And my advice to conservatives is don't accept the premises, reframe the debate. And that is especially true after hearing what Leslin Lewis said about Paris. We've got to wrap things up. My thanks to all of you for tuning into the program. We'll talk to you next week here on The Andrew Lawton Show. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.